right now. Okay, um, first of all, I'm going to give you a little background to the study and the work that we've done here at Covey in Ontario. Um, and I'm also going to give you some information or, or, or the words, explain the, the, the foam terminology words, so you understand during the webin webinar what I'm actually referring to when I, when I talk about them. I'm going to also touch briefly on some of the practical projects that we've been doing, um, from press fractioning to uh, the use of bentonite, disgorging and gushing issues, and our dosage trials. So I'm going to touch on a few. Um, and see where we go and give you some information about where we're going next really. So how this all came about, well, there's been, in Canada, there's been an enormous growth in sparkling wine production, um, not just in Ontario, but also British Columbia, Nova Scotia and Quebec, and it's just growing all the time. Um, and that's being apparent as we, we just found out about Oh, yesterday, five new wineries opened up in Ontario, all of which will be also producing sparkling wine. And that's just been in the last six months. Um, well, actually, it took longer than to set it up, but obviously that's the official opening has been in the last six months. So the sparkling wine craze has hit Nova Scotia and Quebec as well. One of the things I noticed and we found out when I arrived here was the winemaker's desire for more in-depth information and research at every stage of winemaking, not just the chemistry work, not just uh, the bubble physics, um, not just the viticulture, but actually what to do when, how much to put in, how much not to put in, the timing, um, the severity of doing things um, and what happens if you don't do things as well. So that's where we started with the project. We actually, our first project um, was uh, the dosage project, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment. One of the reasons for that is we noticed quite a lot of wines were being made that had still wines added to the dosage. And um, that had a number of reasons. And rather than me just tell them what the difficulty is with dosage was actually to show them. So that's what we did with that study. We've also included projects in the vineyard, the viticulture issues, and also projects right through to the finished wine. Uh, one of the first things to remember as we go through this webinar uh, is never, never treat grapes in the vineyard or the base wine in the same way you do a still white wine. So that's what we're going to cover in a bit more detail in a moment. So next, the first project that I'm going to mention is press fractions. But for those of you, I'm sure you do, but just in case there's anybody listening who is not involved uh, straight away, sort of on a practical level, um, I'm just going to sort of briefly mention the traditional method, which is where all our studies are focused on here in, in Ontario. Um, so we, so our study, first of all, on press fractions happened right up quite, uh, well, quite straight away after harvest. We've also looked uh, today, which we're going to cover, is bentonite and proteins. We also did some gushing work at disgorging that we had some problems with in some of the wineries, which we tackled, as well as the dosage. There have been some other studies in between, but they're either ongoing, haven't been completed, um, or some other ones that are just about to start. So, press fractioning. Well, before we get into that, we need to understand the terminology used in foam and foam analysis. You'll hear the word foam height mentioned a lot in the sparkling wine, and, and there seems to be more and more research being undertaken in this area. So, the foam height is the height of the foam upon pouring the wine. And if you see in the diagram below, I've attempted to sort of show you, it's basically from the bottom where those, bu those bubbles are submerged into the wine, actual liquid into the wine, up to the top. Then we also are very interested in foam stability time. And that's basically the length of time that those bubbles, that foam stays there. There's a whole bunch of methods to analyze this, which are quite intricate. Uh, but we're not going to go into those or compare those and look at those today. The thing about this foam uh, issue is that it's a very expensive pastime to make a, make a gorgeous sparkling wine, heartbreakingly and painfully long process. Somebody buys it, they pour the wine and it's flat. It's a very expensive way to make a still wine. So that's where, why there's so much fascination in the science world about how each stage of production and what chemicals can affect 
uh, a more compositional chem uh, sort of compositional changes, I should say, in the grapes and the wine can affect foaming. So let's just also hear about the this these terminology with regards to bubble and effervescence because it will help you understand what else is involved. So this part on, on my right, if I'm looking at the screen, is the chain of bubbles from its nucleation point rising up. And now the strange circle at the top is my attempt to draw a, a, a bubble, a sparkling wine bu bubble. And you'll see this dark sort of purpley pink uh, burgundy color around it. That actually represents a double layer. And that double layer is a film and it holds in that CO2. And that film is made up of proteins, polysaccharides, a whole bunch of other things, but mainly those two. It's what we, we often refer to it as a biopolymer. Uh, or bio is made from biopolymers. So over here, you'll see an arrow on the left with regards to liquid air interface. And, and basically, this is how uh, this is why uh, sparkling wine and champagne bubbles are referred to as wet foam. And there's a number of other products that have wet foam, but it, but why that is is it means that there's no um, sorry there's space between the bubbles. Uh, within the liquid, whereas in beer, it's referred to as a dry foam because there's no space, those interlocking bubbles in beer stick together. So this is quite important as well, this space in between here with regard and how many bubbles are submerged with regards to bubbles bursting and things. So this foam on the top is also referred to in, we have a whole bunch of things um, that influence it, production processes on the right you'll see fining, when to fine, if you should fine at all, hopefully not. Um, if you filter too much the base wine, that will have an effect and uh, and too much filtering will mean you, you're you pulling out other things that you need. So we don't want to go to, to 0.45 on a filter for sparkling wine, for instance, for, for base wine that's going to sparkling wine. Um, other things, grape variety, pectic enzymes that we add, fining and filtering, but also the glass that the wine is served in, how that glass has been taken care of or washed, the temperature. What about the chemical composition of the, of the compounds? Well, the first thing is proteins. And proteins and grape variety are actually interlinked over there. And that's because different grape varieties have different types of protein makeup, protein, or, sorry, com are composed of different proteins. One of the things is, for instance, we use in Ontario Riesling grapes for sparkling, which is growing in popularity. Um, and it's only a few producers, but we're seeing it grow. And it has a Riesling's a funny old one in that it has different types of protein makeup. So it actually becomes quite problematic and quite challenging here in Ontario. Um, but we're tackling that at the moment. Amino acids, lipids, and polysaccharides. After proteins, polysaccharides are the most important for, for that film around the bubbles. Glycerol, biogenic amine, so things like histamine and tyrosine really, uh, more than histamine. Polyphenol, so phenolic compounds, which is why you can have difficulties and rose, uh, with rosé wine and that can be a bit more challenging, especially disgorging for instance. Um, ethanol, uh, organic acids, too much SO2 and then down here on the left, you will see challenges with regards to the health of the fruit. So if gluconic acid is in the in the base wine, and that comes from botrytis, uh, then we, that severely affects the both the foam height and the stability of the foam. So uh, as little or none, which we all know, I know uh, I was sort of stating the obvious there. We don't know about sour rot and whether sour rot affects uh, foam. But um, I think with regards to the knowledge that we have so far, we can probably say yes, that that definitely does affect it. But with regards to the science, we don't have any science behind that at the moment. So in the picture, you can see on the left, uh, wine that's got quite poor effervescence is dying out quite quickly and one on the right. Now, the other thing is we don't want loads and loads of CO2 in there either. We don't want to put our noses in, somebody pour wine and put our noses in and, and just get hit by CO2. So it's a happy medium. So the pressure at bottling has to be calculated so well that we don't go over and just uh, and, and fill people's glasses with CO2. Because of course, 
what can happen is people can think they've got really good foam, pour a glass of wine out uh, into, into this sort of nice wine glass. And what then tends to happen is that it might bubble up and give you a nice froth, if you like, and we call it more froth. Uh, and then suddenly it just shoots away and disappears really quickly. Um, and so that can be problematic as well, because then we haven't got, people want to sip, they like seeing the bubbles rising. And if we haven't got the chemical composition right in the base wine, the juice and the base wine, then that's going to be uh, a, a serious problem for the final wine. Okay, let's just talk briefly about proteins. Um, they're in tiny amounts in wine. Um, particularly in sparkling, uh, but they are the principal compounds associated with the foaming properties of sparkling wines. There's copious amounts of studies been on this, not just us, uh, we've only done a small amount, but um, Champagne and Carver, they're the main people that have done an awful lot of work on this, but also um, some studies in other places in Europe, uh, or Italy as well. So the base wines contain the, the grape proteins and manoproteins come from the yeast. So we, so what happens is we need both of those in our in our base wines to allow for foaming. If you strip out with bentonite, and I'm going to talk about that this in a moment, all the grape derived proteins from the wine or, or by fining the juice because people do tend to get a bit worried about um, protein haze in sparkling. What you're actually doing is you're taking away the stability of the wine. If you just have yeast proteins, you pour, pour, and because you've ripped everything out, you pour the wine, and there's the situation where it froths up and then disappears quite quickly. But somehow the grape protein, we don't actually understand what this, this sort of interaction is or how it works, but they are certainly different molecular weights, but the grape proteins keep the stability of the foam going and going, whereas the yeast... Um, will keep it bubbling, but it, it, the, the grey proteins give the stability of it. So it could be that different mo molecular weights are having an effect. It could be that they're acting synergistically, but um, it's quite dangerous to then pull everything out uh, and find that juice uh, or, or that base wine uh, with bentonite for fear of hazing. Now, I, when I talk about this, the studies have mainly been done on Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, um, a little bit on Pinot Meunier, but the focus on foam and proteins has mainly been on those two varieties. There have been some studies that have involved other grape varieties um, in Spain at the University of Navarra, and they include things that um, grape varieties native to Spain that they're considering, I guess, for, for making wine. So they're sort of doing research to check out on those. And Tempranillo, or Tempranillo, uh, is included in that. So I'm going to talk a little bit in, in a moment about those. So... This is, these studies were done um, both with Riesling, um, oh gosh, Pinot Noir, uh, and also in uh, Glera, in Prosecco, and the same results happen all the time. Um, well, actually, for most varieties, but not all. I can't say that for all of them, but that's certainly in effect. So please don't pull everything out uh, and strip your base wine out. We want, we want some of all that sort of good stuff that you're trying to pull out. We want that in there. So next slide. Okay, one of the things that's really interesting about these proteins is the Australians did a study and they analyzed the chitinase and grape thal, sorry, you have to excuse my pronunciation, talmate, let's just call them TLP, shall we? Um, and, they, and the thing is that they are most abundant in grapes and they are the part of the cause of haze in white wines. However, one of the studies um, that was done by the uh, Australians found that the, the wines that had higher levels of TLPs and, and chitinase, or chitinase, depending on where you're coming from, um, actually had far better foaming and, and foaming for far longer. The stability and the height was far better of the foam. So those proteins, while we don't want them in our base wines, we do want some of them. In our, in our sparkling wines to hold on to that wine. So that's quite um, an interesting challenge. Now, that's something that wineries themselves can taste, uh, test and do at home and strip out and do some small, or, or somebody in your area could possibly do that. And just see for yourself the effect of, of finding uh, the base wine with bentonite compared to, finding, to, to not finding, and just have a look at the bubbles. And it will happen quite quickly. It will happen you know, within a year, and that's something that you guys could try. 
So going back to what I mentioned earlier as well, um, there have been some studies as well with regards to filtration. And if you filter wines, base wines too much, um, and that, by that I mean sterile, do not sterile filter down to 0.45, then you're also stripping stuff out, particularly proteins and things that we don't want. So proteins are really, really important in our wines, and we try to monitor them as much as we can all the way through. Turbidity levels don't always tell you the, the full story. And also, if you go to bottle a one turbidity level, then and you think it's quite high, that you wouldn't bottle a base wine at, uh, sorry, a still wine, um, but you should still be able to, depending on the on the level, you know, sort of three upwards. I've heard winemakers who have bottled with a turbidity level of seven, um, and, and it's all cleared itself up during long lease aging. So um, don't worry too much. It's very difficult to find protein haze in sparkling wine, extremely difficult. Um, but if anyone does find any, please do let, uh, let, uh, let me know. Okay. What other things affect um, foam? Well, one of the high, one of the biggest problems is ethanol as well. If you've got a base wine that's shot up too high in alcohol, um, or the brick, or you picked it too late and the bricks levels are too high at harvest, um, then that's going to give you too much alcohol, and that means you're going to have tremendous trouble. Uh, not just with not so much, but you've got high acid in there as well, so not so much that side, but it's definitely going to affect the foam. Um, so that can happen from incorrect sugar calculations of bottling as well. And so we always need to check residual sugar levels before bottling and double check the amount of sugar uh, that's also, sorry, that's, that's going into, into the wine itself um, before you add sugar into it to get, get up that one and a half percent, because you only want to go up one and a half percent for the second ferment. Acid type. Uh, well, acids also uh, affect foaming. There have been an awful lot of studies that have included acids, um, but none that have focused solely on acids. But what we do know from studies done is that tartaric acid has a positive effect on foaming height. Malic acid increases the foam's height, but doesn't stay stable. So I guess I kind of, we could say malic acid contributes to frother. Uh, frothing, you know, sort of making a, a wine a frother, if you like. Lactic acid also in, increases foam stability, but not the height. And of course, gluconic acid, which I mentioned earlier, uh, affects all of it. So we don't want any botrytis fruit, really. Phenolic compounds do as well. Now, the thing with phenolic compounds is it really starts becoming quite complicated because different anthocyanin families, whether they're if you consider all of the anthocyanins or break them up individually, the same with the tannins. Um, so that's quite a complicated area, and I'm not sure that's particularly useful for you, um, for me to cover today. But I can give you details on that should anyone ask. But for the time being, we'll just say that's one of the difficulties with, with rosé wine is getting that, um, that phenolic compound level um, to, the, to a stable position where you can retain colour but not, not have gushing and, uh, and problems and things of disgorging. Okay, fatty acids and lipids also have been found to have an effect, but only when the alcohol level is below 5%. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that and see if that changes in the future with other studies. Sulfur dioxide, if you over sulfur, that will also decrease the foam height and stability. Now, the challenges for winemakers with regards to all this sort of thing, like, well, this all, that's all brilliant. Thank you for that chemistry information. But there's no up, absolute or optimal or suggested or best concentrations for these compounds in sparkling wine, white rosé um, or red sparkling wines at all. But it is really useful to have this sort of information when you are a winemaker to take it in, to, you know, sort of take that on board and have a think of it at each, each stage of production, certainly with regards to major effects like proteins and things. So let's have a look at, gosh, I'm only on, right, I'm just watching the slide number. Harvest. Um, let's go back a little bit and see how we can tackle these chemical. Uh, the chemical composition at each stage. So the sugar and acid levels we know are really important um, and you're a nice hot warmer region than we are certainly. We have also found in studies, excuse me, <coughs> we also found in studies that a ratio of 4 to 5.5 
uh, produces wines with best or, or optimal foam ability. Now, that means four equals the Briggs level and 5.5 is the acid. So that ratio produces the best, best foam ability. So keep an eye on that's a calculation you guys can do at harvest as well quite easily. So we also know that grapes picked at more mature ripeness levels um, will have far less foaming because you've got, for all number of reasons, the composition has an effect. So press fractioning is where we started our studies at the beginning. So press fractioning, well, we want cool temperatures. Um, and if you have got nice cool temperatures in your grapes and you're, you've picked at night, you could possibly press straight away after picking. We want a whole bunch pressing. Uh, gentle, gradual increase in pressure. We want uh, nice, slow, low juice extraction. We want to fraction them actually physically, fraction those uh, those sections, those pieces of those, what's the word I was looking for, um, juice off the press into separate containers. Now, if we look at the champagne pressing based on 4,000 kilograms, that's how it stands at the moment, the cuvee and the ties. But the interesting thing is that this was actually set up quite some time ago in Champagne and presses have changed since then. The composition of the grapes have changed, especially with climate change and different harvest dates and things. So that's whether that actually stands and whether that could work for everybody else is unlikely. You can't transfer it. And there's also a number of other reasons which I'm going to come to, but things like it depends on the press type depends on the number of cycles and the press cycle you have in your press, depends on the pressure your press goes up to. But let's give you an idea working on a champagne press that we did uh, at Covey. You can see here, um, for, for one particular uh, winery where this came about, they were really interested in this because they, they didn't put a fraction of their press and put it all together and you pr produce a far lower quality sparkling wine you're never gonna get gold awards and be able to command high prices. When we did this study, we also considered looking at the different blending options. So fraction one um, could, could be really is your high quality wine. Now, I haven't included in this the free one juice because that was a decision um, and is a decision made by the winemaker each year whether to include, in, include it or not, depending on the color, depending on the flavor, depending on the dirt, the phenolics. Um, and the health of the grapes. So free run juice was not included in this study at all. So we know that the best fraction always for top quality sparkling wine comes out of the first, the first press fraction. Now we had a look at some options and some did some financial and economic costs and things and some other solutions to how to use those other fractions. Um, and that could include blending, it could be um, fermenting that wine and using in a dosage. It is lower quality than the other one. You could blend it into another rosé, a white wine, um, how, however, you've got to have a think about that. And when you get right down to the last fractions, you're really looking at far poorer quality. So you could sell some to the distillery. Um, you could have a second label if you really wanted to. Um, and how much you use or which fraction it what. Um, would be up to you depending on the press. So we used in our study the Butcher Champagne Press and I've tried to illustrate, excuse this slide, but I've tried to illustrate um, this, this is the pink line where we went and you can see on here, see how high the pressure goes. Now when we do our research wines, when I make the research wines here at Covey, we never press more than one and um, that's because ours is a smaller press takes much smaller loads, um, but we know that when on a smaller press, we press more likely, we're gonna get far better quality fruit that is more in line with commercial sparkling wine than if we press to these sort of levels on this press cycle. Um, so these larger volumes, so this particular press cycle, press cycle uh, took it right up to almost, so it looks like about 1.8 up here, but for the actual, uh, project, we just broke it up into one, two and three as if you were in a commercial winery. Um, it was, we worked with Pinot Noir, Clone 115, we did do whole bunch pressing, we didn't add any enzymes because that would have an effect on the press fraction. We only added 30 parts per million of SO2 and that was in the press. All the wine making was done in triplica, we didn't do, need to do malolactic. Um, lots of chemical analysis there you can see. And then we also fermented, we used 
um, EC triple one eight. Don't know why I put um, double one, but it's triple one eight. And the same tirage for every all the fractions as well to go through uh, into bottling. So our press fraction analysis do, going on the basis of that. But you can see that there wasn't much difference in bricks, but you can definitely see the press frac the, the effect of fractioning on acidity. And you can see that a TA in the press fraction was um, was a nice healthy 8.3. But by the time you get to press fraction three, now you're sitting on 6.3. Same with the pH has, has um, shot up there. The nitrogen level has gone up the more you press. Um, I'm not sure how important 160 compared to 153 milligrams of nitrogen per litre really would be in the winery, but it's worth pointing out. Um, malic acid drops down. So this the, this first press, press fraction was 3.9. And the turbidity jumps around a bit. So that's the juice analysis before we went into ferment. So if we go and look at the base wine um, prior to bottling, you can still see that oh, there's no difference in our alcohol level, but we have got an acidity difference again of 7.7 .7 in the top quality one. Um, I'd like a little bit higher, but uh, that's fine. And six on the press fraction three. Lowest pH uh, is in is in the first press fraction. Our yan um, going into second fermentation was 4.5. We would have added more nitrogen to all of those. Um, anyway to top them up, but you can still see there's a bit of a difference. The other interesting thing is though, the residual sugar level was highest in the third press fraction. And that residual sugar level was mainly fructose. And the thing is with fructose is that the yeast don't like it as much as they do glucose. The other stuff is that it has a perception of being far sweeter than glucose anyway. You could, if you taste that, taste glucose uh, in a wine compared one that is considered dry, it will have some fructose in it. So that's quite interesting. Um, even though even though there wasn't any sort of difference between alcohol levels, we've still got that that um, sort of double on the residual sugar side. Okay. The other thing is the oxidation. We accelerated its oxidation of the wine because we haven't got we haven't got time to wait for a couple of years. So we accelerated the wine, um, and we had a look at, at the absorbance of 420 nanometers. And what you can see is the press fraction is just. Yeah, and you can see it in colour. You can see in the graph that the phenolic contents and the oxidi uh, the the oxidation is setting in. Press fraction one uh, with that blue one it has the lowest amount of oxidizable compounds in it. That's the one on the left there. So, so what did we learn from that? If we just if I just summarise it, um, it's quite interesting to remember that on the Champagne website actually they the Champenois refer to ties um, must as producing intensely aromatic wines, fruitier in youth than those made from the cuvee, but far less age worthy. Well, they don't last at all long if you use um, the ties, I have to say. They don't age well at all. Um, and yeah, the, the fruity characters don't last long at all either. So press fraction one gave us the highest acidity, the lowest pH, the highest color and the highest foam stability. The press fraction two, medium, medium pH and medium color. Press fraction three, we're not even going to talk about anymore. Um, but that isn't, that's pretty much the same um, as have been found in previous studies, um, both in Champagne and in the UK. In the UK, um, this comes from a study done um, by Richard, um, Dr. Richard Marshall at the Univer uh, University of Brighton at Plumpton College campus. And you can see in this press fraction, um, he's he's taken eight samples here, and this is the colour of Chardonnay, the progression as you're going along. Um, now, obviously, you can add some SO2 if you are going to press it right to the end. But again, if you look at the chemical composition, it's not going to be uh, quality wine anyway. And he and and the guys in England, when they did their study, they also found the same thing. You can see. The other thing that's interesting to take note is what they refer to as the retrousse or the return. So in this up the top, you will see cycle one, cycle two, retruce one. And that's where the balloon starts deflating and the, the, the grapes um, are, are sort of turned over inside the press. And you can see what happens there, that the acidity shoots right down and then back it up again. So there are ways 
that you know that's that only lasts a few minutes but you're still as that bag deflates you're still getting more of that oxidized wine um well, it's not oxi or oxidizable um juice into there and there are ways depending on the press to funnel that off elsewhere um but i'm not a press expert um so i'm not going to talk about the technical side of it but i have seen wineries that do it and there are there are wineries that are able to to uh, circumnavigate that and get that out. So conditions to consider for pressing. Um, it's important that you, you as winemakers have to do that yourself and practice that yourself. You know your, your juice, you know your grapes and you know your press type. But you have to think about the press type, the press size and the press cycles. The pressing level per, per fraction, as I showed you earlier, um, 1.8 1 is quite high. Uh, probably too high a little bit. Uh, the grape variety, the health of the grapes, whether you've done manual or mechanical harvesting, that will also have an effect. The SO2 level uh, you, that um, is added at the press. The initial grape ripeness level, um, whether you do whole bunch pressing and the grape temperature and picking at pressing. So there's quite a few things to consider. It is something that you, you guys can do. And maybe one person who's, uh, if you've all got, you know, a bunch of people who've got similar presses, then that could be something that you'll chip in and help help one winery to do to give you an example. But it takes practice. And if you haven't got a champagne press, um, then another alternative could possibly be someone standing by the, by the press tasting. <laughs> but there's a couple of ways to do it. So let's go back to mentioning the next stage, which was now the wines have been been um, been picked and press fraction. This is a different study. This was actually done with uh, Maria Field Feld clone, which we have here in Ontario. It might go by another name in other countries, but that's the the Maria Field clone from Switzerland. And what we did was we wanted to show the our wine makers about the effect of bentonite. So on the first two studies on the left. Um, we we didn't add any bentonite at all in the juice stage and on the right we did and we added so much that we actually stripped out the grape proteins this was actually done um some work done by one of our master's students and her name's esther on guta um and um and she's all sort of signed up and, and completes to msc now but what you'll see is our control was no bentonite at all which was t1 we called T3, just had bentonite in a bottling, so a riddling, as a riddling agent. The bent, uh, number five, we just, T5, we just uh, went on into bottle with the bentonite only, only affecting the juice. And T8 basically had a double dose, bentonite, bentonite juice, and then bentonite as a riddling agent. And this is what happened. Uh, this is the impact to the foam. You can see on the left, the yellow mustard colored one, uh, that had no bentonite at all, but it had the highest amount of foam. Uh, or, or I should say foam stability, because you can see the amount of time on the left, uh, 10 minutes that it took to elapse is quite something. So like watching paint dry, but uh, number T3 in the blue um, had the second most. So that's only had two, only had bentonite added to at the bottling stage as a riddling agent. But I do want to pull your attention as well to that big line across the middle there. And that represents a uh, standard deviation, that error bar. And what that also tells us, though, when you look at it like that, that I mean, gosh, that's an enormous, enormous standard error bar. Um, sorry, error bar. And one of the problems with that is that it shows you that if you just add, in our study, the, the Bentonite added just in the tirage had far higher variability between bottles because we tested quite a few bottles on each of these stages. Um, so, but the wine with no bentonite at all uh, didn't didn't have that sort of level of variability. Now, the other thing is, if you, if as a winemaker you're going to lay your bottles down and you're going to let them ferment at 12 degrees for a long period of time, then you don't need to bentonite necessarily depending on the grape variety i should just hasten um be careful there but if you're going to if you're going to lay down the wine and do it at uh, ferment and store it at 15 then you are going to need bentonite if, especially for a shorter length of time and that's one of the reasons for that is you get so many different types 
of Eastleys and stuck or non-stuck or fluffy, whatever the case. So you've got to really know, playing with bentonite is one thing, but you've got to really take into account the, the, the storage temperature and also the second fermentation temperature. So there's a few other things to take, in, uh, take on board there as well. So that's our study results. We also took the opportunity to subject those wines to a sensory analysis panel. And what we found was also quite interesting. Let's look at the control with no, um, with no, ben no bentonite used at all. And here it's held on to its acidic and citrusy characters. When we treated the juice only, and we've stripped out so much. By doing that, we stripped out quite a lot of aromatic characters, I think, by the looks of things. Um, you can see vegetal is, is sitting really close to that vegetal character. The, when we added bentonite both to the juice and stripped it all, and then also in as a tirage, a riddling agent, you can see we've got far more fruity characters, interestingly enough. We've got orange spice and pineapple. And then over there, when we've just added it to, to a bottling, in the tirage, we've got grapefruit, yeasty, autolytic characters come through. So very distinctive, very distinctive, um, uh, carry, um, sorry, sensorial or, or organolep organoleptic characters, my apologies, um, just by the timing of this sort of bentonite. So that's another consideration, how you could alter and change your sparkling wines by, by this, uh, these sort of things. Okay, the next thing we tackled was disgorging. Loads of um, issues and difficulties. I would advise you have a checklist and go through them and tick them off uh, prior to even starting to disgorge. And there's a list through here. We've got ambient temperatures, the angle of the bottle, too much neck freezing, too fast, um, uh, rough handling, you know, these things have to be handled so gently and calmly from one place to another. You can't break them up after three years of being asleep. They've got to be stay, keep, stay asleep until they actually end up on the disgorging line. Um, grape variety and vintage variation can have, can have difficulties. Um, all sorts of things there. Tartrate and calcium crystals. In the study that we did, we found that there were some uh, Poor riddling, the, there was still some yeast left over. And we also found that a uh, little bit of tartrate crystals um, in the study that we did for one of our wineries. But there's a list of other things that it could be uh, as well when that happens. Our dosage uh, project, well, we wanted to do this uh, to show the winemakers how it can impact on the foam and flavour of sparkling wines, even by just adding this tiny amount at the end of the production process, and the effect of sugar on foam and flavour. So there's a dosage calculation for you. I can, I can give this uh, presentation to, to Texas after I've done this. So this is what we did. We took a winery, an Ontario winery, non-vintage wine, and we used it as a dosage. So on the left there, we added sugar and then we didn't. So the zero dosage, we didn't add any sugar in the dosage. We just topped it up with the original wine. And the same, the brute with sugar, we topped it up with the original wine and put in some sugar in. All those uh, wines that had sugar, we brought them all up to eight grams per litre, plus or minus two. We added 20 mils of dosage and the wines that went in, to dosage with the, was the oldest wine in the house, the Pinot Noir 2009, unoaked still wine, oaked Chardonnay still wine, um, a Vidal ice wine that we made here, and brandy. I can guarantee you that nobody wants to put um, own brandy on its own over into a do dosage again, but needed to go in because we needed to know what it could bring chemically wise. So obviously there was a difference between pH, TA, you know, residual sugar because we had one and zero dosage, little bit in alcohol, um, tiny bit in free and total SO2, oxygen, dissolved oxygen there was. The zero dosage had far more dissolved oxygen in it. One of the reasons for that is that is the viscosity that the sugar adds to it. And the other thing to remember, and we kept to this in our trial in all our trials, is that whenever you close bottles or do, uh, you know, finally at the end after disgorging, is that you want to make sure that your cork is at least 24 millimeters inside the bottle, so you've got the correct headspace between the, the cork and the bottle. 
to, to offer protection. So we followed these wines over 15 uh, weeks and we analysed them 5, 10 and 15 weeks. And there was a bit of difference at five weeks in the chemicals that we analysed, but by 15, between the zero uh, dosage and, and uh, its same, its, its sister that had been given, uh, given some sugar, and you can see that what happens though, by 15 weeks, they're really, really similar. So up here on the left quadrant, you can see zero dosage and brood sugar. So chemically wise, they're really, really similar. Um, this is a, a PCA. The further apart wines are, the more different they are on here. So the brandy poor soul is right out here on its own. The unoaked and the oak chardonnay down here at the bottom are quite close together. And so is the ice one is, is also sitting in that quadrant. Now, these three wines are all wines that were made with still, are all sparkling wines with the dosage being from still wine. Up the top half, the two quadrants, you'll see on the left hand quadrant, you'll see all the sparkling wines that are made with, with, with sparkling wines in the dosage. Incidentally, when we did sensory analysis and we did a tasting of the Fizz Club with all the Ontario winemakers, the, all the winemakers preferred, the first of all, the wine that had, that had the oldest vintage in the house used as a dosage. And secondly, they liked the wine topped up with itself plus sugar. So it's just an idea for people to play around with themselves. But um, my advice is always to try other sparkling wines as top ups or the same sparkling wine as a top up, but not to not to go for for still wine so much because it can it can change so much the flavor of the wine it's i always go with like for like and so that with regards to sparkling into sparkling so we also found on our dosage study that when you had no sugar in it at all the foam took ages to collapse so we had a really good foam stability from the dosage wines um then the, the oldest Pinot in the house had the second and one reason I suspect for that is that it's had longer lease aging so the proteins are probably there's higher levels of proteins in there probably and so on. Um, we had to also run it past a uh, sensory analysis and a test and we wanted to make sure that we could actually find out whether there was a difference between these wines um, otherwise it would be a fairly pointless exercise. And one of the good things was at 73% and 63 correct answers out of 80, there was definitely a big difference. We didn't include the zero dosage wine in that because we knew there was a difference because it was so, it had no sugar in, so it was pointless to enter it in. But that was with 20 mils. Oh, um, and another way to do it is add your, make your 600 um, grams per litre residual sugar solution. Um, and, and 10 mils, but some people can do 12 mils, it depends. Obviously, your, your calculations will differ. So just to show you the difference on sugar now, zero dose, dosage may be sort of coming in and be, uh, not coming in, but may be very interesting and, and very popular. But um, you have to really set out from the beginning to make a decent zero dosage. And you've got to have the right acid levels. You've got to know that you're going to, going to age it for longer. Um, so in our study, we did eight grams per litre of, of sugar and zero sugar. And after one week, uh, sorry, after five weeks, the, the wine with the sugar had far lower aromatic alcohols. And then the zero dosage with no sugar at all had much higher levels of these sort of fruity ethyl esters. But as I showed you just now, no difference in aroma compounds three months later. And why we did that for three months is because we're always looking to see how wines change over that time between finishing the wine off and, and the dosage being added and the bottle being corked before a winery lets it out the door. I'm just watching my time. So I was looking up for you guys in Texas, um, some of the studies on Tempranillo. I know you grow Tempranillo. I'm not sure whether any of you may use it as a sparkling wine, but bringing it in earlier. Um, the guys in Spain have been doing an awful lot of studies on different um, Spanish varieties. And I suspect that might be linked to climate change um, challenges. And I also suspect it might be linked to some new DOCs that we're seeing opening up. But um, let's just have a look. Well, we know we've, we've sort of talked briefly about the composition. Um, um, it's interesting with Tempranillo. Do you know Tempranillo, even though you've got sort of 600 different clones of it in just in Rioja alone in, in their experimental plot, 
It's got a different anthocyanin to flavanol ratio. Well, what does that mean? Well, anthocyanin is the color compounds and flavanol are those little fellows like the catechin and epicatechin that are considered to be quite bitter on their own, floating around on their own. So I guess um, that's something to look out for and how that would affect foam um, and, and flavor and other things. In Spain, it's been found to have very high levels of uh, pH levels um, whenever they make sparkling wine from it, uh, or they've, they've attempted to. So I don't know how, I don't know enough about Tempranillo in Texas to be able to say how that rolls with pH and acidity. The other thing that's really interesting though, is that Tempranillo, the studies in Spain have shown that Tempranillo has um, polysaccharide, levels of polysaccharides, oligosaccharides, and sort of nitro nitrogenous compounds, like amino acids and things, um, were really high in Tempranillo sparkling wines compared to any other varieties. So one could think about that being as having a really good um, potential, if you like, for foaming stability and, and foaming quality. So I'll leave that up to you, but um, maybe that's something you, you guys are already doing and, I'm, and I don't know about it, but I don't know whether you'd want to consider using Tempranillo uh, in spark for sparkling. Um, but I have all those papers and things if anybody's particularly interested in reading them. So I'm just bringing the, the session to, to sort of back round about. We've got some future studies coming up. We're going to, we're just finishing our study of leaf removal. We've done eight different treatments. We've got a whole bunch of clones we've been looking at um, for sparkling from four varieties. Um, we're looking at yeast, at, at different sources of nitrogen for second fermentation. We're looking at some specific flavors um, associated with different um, levels of ripeness. That's going to be starting up. And we're looking at aging projects. One of the challenges with sparkling wine is funding lasts for sort of two or three years and yet you have we really need to be looking at some of these you know that just kind of covers uh, making the wine and then the first year of aging or second year of aging in some cases so some aging projects the last five or six years we're, we're hoping to do um this is just a brief show for you to consider viticulture and the grape composition um, and the juice composition and these are the eight studies we did and this is from 2016 last year um and you'll see what a difference um i mean visually you can see the colors but when we ran it through and looked at non-flavonoids and, and compounds that are considered bitter and hydroxycinamic acids there's a big difference so this sort of viticulture and sparkling wine is at, um, in warmer climates um, and, and through warmer um, growing seasons is also an area for study. So as I bring this to a close, um, there's some really important people involved in, in the studies we do. Um, and I just wanted to show you, we've got um, uh, Esther on Guten and did a fabulous job on her masters and a whole bunch of people, Lisa and um, Casey and Shufin, um, we can't do any of our studies and research if we don't have um, assistance and collaboration from commercial wineries, um, whether it be giving us the, you know, the grapes in kind or bottling or disgorging. And of course, we need so many grape pickers, so everybody's involved in that. I've got references, which you probably could just see, but I'm more than happy to send this uh, to you or send you any of the papers on the list. And uh, just as we bring, I bring this to a close, because I'm seeing it's 2.50, um, any questions from anybody?